they usually get a look on their face that's a little bit quizzical, and they, they often ask, why? Why bother? Why research a disease that is basically gone? And I have to explain to them that while m m malaria is gone from the United States predominantly, it's actually a great, a huge problem in the rest of the world. And so here's a map of, of the world, and highlighted in red and, and yellows is where malaria is found currently. Of interest is where Iraq and Afghanistan are, and our troops that are deployed in these countries are still having to deal with malaria every day that they're deployed there. And so this means there's over three and a half billion people that are exposed to malaria every day, and this translates to over a million deaths, 90% of which are children under the age of five. So malaria is not only a huge problem in the rest of the, uh, in the, rest of the world, but it was a massive problem um, a while ago. And in fact, Cleveland was almost wiped off the face of the earth um, only two years after its founding down at Settler's Landing by the Cuyahoga River. The entire population of Cleveland got such bad malaria that they almost gave up on the city completely. Now, 100 years later, in 1877, shown here, where malaria is at its peak, um, we could see how malaria has influenced uh, the growth of Cleveland and the layout of Cleveland. So people moved out of the, out of the um, down by the Cuyahoga River and up the hills. And this works out because mosquitoes like to go, are born in stagnant water, but they never fly about more than half a mile from where they're born, and they hate changes in elevation. And so for this reason, public square is where it is, back from the lakefront and back from the river's edge, so that um, they can avoid and decrease the amount of malaria they're exposed to while still being close to centers of commerce at, at the port. Those who had the means expanded further east out of, out of the, the center of Cleveland, out to Shaker Heights and Cleveland Heights, to further escape uh, more m mosquitoes and malaria. Um, in fact, they instituted uh, strong mosquito control programs that we still use today. And this little change in elevation actually had a natural uh, reduction in the number of mosquitoes that are found up in the heights. And this way of adapting your city and the growth and the layout of your city plays out in every major city uh, throughout the world. As if you look at how the city is laid out, they're usually near fast-moving bodies of water or that have high salt content and all those things that, are, that mosquitoes don't like to grow in. And so that sort of naturally reduced their amount of malaria that they had in those cities. So uh, the malaria is tra transmitted by the, a specific type of mosquito called Anopheles. And it starts by coming along and biting an infected person taking up one of the parasites, which then grows over the next couple of weeks inside of, the, inside of the mosquito. Then the mosquito has to fly along and find another host, which then injects the parasite, goes to the person's liver for a couple of weeks, and then it expands out and becomes, uh, causes the clinical illness that we know as malaria. But the real problem is not just avoiding one mosquito bite. People who live at our research station in Papua New Guinea have, have about 1,000 mosquito bites every single night. And so if only a 10% or 1% of those are infectious, you can see how malaria gets easily transmitted amongst these types of communities. And so we say malaria is this huge problem, but if we take a dedicated effort, we could actually try to overcome it. And it would be a huge, significant um, benefit to humanity if we were able to rid the world of malaria. It would be even greater than the moon landing and more, and more important to the people of the rest of the world. So, but the key to these big, big uh, uh, scientific problems is trying to bring teams of people together. No one person's going to be able to solve malaria, just like no one person could solve the, uh, could uh, land a man on the moon. And so, we had to bring people together, and we wanted to focus on three main themes, which was we wanted to focus on preventing the transmission of malaria, detecting who has malaria in the first place, and be able to come up with new treatments that are going to be effective. So these teams that I've been able to bring together are mostly across the street at Case Western Reserve University, because we're fortunate that we've got a diverse group of scientists and researchers that we can pull on to try and uh, solve some of these questions. And they range from engineers and chemists um, to medical personnel at the School of Medicine. And most importantly, it depends, uh, solving these big research problems depends on funding. Um, just like sending a man to the moon required about $109 billion of today's money, we need some dedicated funding in order to solve these kind of problems. Also across the street is the Center for Global Health and Diseases um, at the School of Medicine. And you may not know, but one of the world's leading mal malaria research units is actually right, over, right across the street. So this was recently recognized as an international center of excellence for malaria research by the NIH, which means that we're tasked with solving malaria in Southeast Asia, which is uh, just about going to be the hardest place ever to get rid of malaria because of all the islands and lots of swampy, low-lying areas. Uh, but we think we're up to the task. So the first thing is to address problems. 
Uh, so the, one of the main problems, of course, is the mosquito itself. What do we do about those? In this country, we had, when we got rid of malaria, we focused almost exclusively on getting rid of the mosquitoes. We sprayed DDT, we drained swamps, we flooded lakes with oil slicks to kill the, to kill the mosquitoes. But these are things we don't really, that aren't really viable in the rest of the world, um, and they're not as eco now that we're a little bit more ecologically sensitive, we don't focus on these kinds of methods to get rid of the mosquitoes. So one way is to give people bed nets. So you get, if you give a person a bed net, it's like having a screened in house over your bed and which will prevent the mosquito from getting through and biting you while you sleep. And this works because the mosquitoes generally only bite at night when people are sleeping. And so we want to encourage people to put their, especially their kids under these bed nets. So along with the United Nations Foundation and uh, the Nothing But Nets, their, their program Nothing But Nets, um, and, and the NBA, we've been able to distribute bed nets to almost three million people. Another idea is to try and create a vaccine. There's a common misconception that there is a vaccine for malaria, and while people are working on it, it's not super effective. So we wanted to come up with a better, better way. And looking around at the resources that we had here at Case Western Reserve, uh, we saw that we had these great huge, um, the High Performance Computing Center over in Kelvin Smith Library, which is right across the street. And this computing center brings together a lot of power that will allow us to uh, interrogate different questions uh, in virtual reality. And so we thought we could, hey, we could use this to try and create a better vaccine. And we also joined forces with the, uh, um, with the Department of Biochemistry to help us design the molecules to look at, to see what we could explore. And fortunately, this, this project was funded by the NIH. So here's a, pro, here's a protein that we think will, will be important to disrupt its interaction between this protein and, and the human erythrocyte. And so this is a good target for uh, creating a vaccine. And so what we do in virtual reality is that we take different compounds and different structures and throw them at this protein and see which ones stick. And the beauty of this is we don't have to go out and buy all these, all these compounds. We don't have to test them all. We can make all these changes in the computer, and the computer will tell us if anything is particularly viable. So we're able to focus on, on this one, which is called VS2, um, which is a protein that almost 100% disrupts the parasite's ability to interact with a red blood cell. The next problem is detecting malaria. It's not, often when I see malaria patients at our clinics in Papua New Guinea, you can look at somebody and know they've got malaria because they're sweaty, they've got kind of jaundiced eyes, um, and we might just pretend, just take their temperature and give them anti-malarial drugs just because, of, just because of those symptoms. But the real way to detect malaria is to take a small blood sample from a finger, just, just like you would do for, um, for an insulin test for if you were diabetic, and you put it on a slide and it looks kind of like this on the, uh, behind you. I mean. So those balls, the, the pink balls are, are red blood cells, and the purple things are, are the malaria parasites growing in somebody's bloodstream. So we have to put that blood on a slide in order to get this picture. But you have to be pretty highly trained in order to do this. This person has lots of malaria, so it's pretty easy to detect. But malaria sort of uh, is, hides a lot in different parts of your body, and it's not always into your bloodstream, so it's hard to detect. Also, when we're in field, when we're trying to detect people's, uh, if they have malaria in the field, there are things that go wrong. There are bugs that crawl around on the slides that make it kind of hard to read and figure out if they have malaria, such like this. So these are kind of, these are also big problems. So what we did is also look around Case Western and see what, who could help us with some of these issues to come up with a, a way to detect malaria more efficiently. And we found, our, we found collaborators in the departments of biophysics and biomedical engineering to help the build a device that would allow us to detect malaria. We also received funding from the Wallace Coulter Foundation and the NIH's Clinical Translational Science Collaborative, which was, uh, gave us some money to get, build some prototype devices. So here's uh, malaria again inside of a red blood cell. But highlighted in the red circles behind me is this brown stuff. And what's that? That is called hemozoin. So hemozoin is the breakdown product of hemoglobin digestion. The parasites eat your hemoglobin. That's the stuff that makes your blood look red. And they, make, and they get their food out of it. However, they've got this byproduct, or malaria poop, that they have to do something with, and they can't get rid of it. Now, because the word heme is Latin for iron, so this brown stuff has magnetic properties because it's got some iron in it. And here's some pictures that I took in my lab of a parasite digesting a red blood cell. So that black stuff that's zipping, zipping around in the centers, that's the parasite eating the hemoglobin. So what we did is we took small bits of people's blood and we put them into a sample chamber here in the middle. And 
normally, if you don't apply a magnetic field, the hemozoan will be sort of floating all over the place and sort of randomly oriented. But if you apply a really strong magnetic field, it'll block your view of the laser from getting through a sample. So the amount of light that you can transmit through a, through a blood sample is directly correlated to the amount of parasites that are in the person's blood. The best thing about this is it's totally objective and it takes about a minute, whereas detecting people's uh, malaria by slide can take to up to an hour. This device also has the benefit of building the whole thing costs about $200. Um, and anybody could do it. Any nurse or anybody willing to take a small drop of blood could do it, and you don't have to be highly trained. Finally, the, the last problem is treatment. So just like with antibiotics such as penicillin, overuse and misuse throughout, throughout time has diminished the use of, of penicillin. In the same exact way, the misuse of anti-malarial drugs has meant that they are no longer effective. The other problem is, if you treat somebody with a drug that's not effective and they've had to walk three days to your malaria clinic, this is a real problem because they'll continue to get sick as they try to walk home and at some point, hopefully before they get home, they'll turn around and have to come back to get another treatment or for a different drug. But sometimes they can't make that return trip. So it's a really big, big issue if you give some, somebody the wrong drug. So we wanted to quickly be able to find new anti-malarial drugs uh, to give to people. So the, we thought the best way would be, well, let's start with drugs that are already in existence. We don't want to go and try, through all the whole FDA pro, uh, approval process if we can avoid it. So we screened all the known FDA drugs uh, for their ability to inhibit parasite growth. Also, we went out into the communities that we, where we treat people, and we said, maybe we should go, uh, what do you guys use from Larry? You've been living with this for 10,000 years. Everybody's got a solution of some sort. Some are better, some are worse. So we asked people what they used. And so in collaboration with Karak Chemistries, which is a local chemical company, along with the University of Utah and Medicines for Malaria Venture, um, we were able to get funding from the School of Medicine and to explore some of these options. And we found some. One was actually a cancer drug developed for leukemia uh, called SU11274. Um, and so we found out that this drug is, works great inside of test tubes to kill malaria, and also we gave it to mice in, uh, in vivo is what that means. Uh, gave it to mice, and it works pretty well in mice also. And so we were able to file a patent on this, and hopefully we can move this quickly through the FDA process because it's already approved for use in humans. Another thing we found is that in a in tribe in Fiji actually has a sponge that lives just off the coast of where a lot of people, uh, of where big communities are. And so what they do is they dive down, they get this sponge, and they dry it out. And whenever they've got fevers or chills, they take a little bit of this stuff. And it turns out that there are three incredibly potent um, anti-malarial drugs inside of that small sponge. And so malaria is this huge disease of poverty. Everybody's sick all the time in a lot of the rest of the world. So it makes it hard for you to work, for you to make money. It makes it hard for communities to grow and expand. It makes it hard for countries to, get, uh, to dig themselves out of poverty. Because you can't build roads, you can't build buildings because everybody's sick. And so malaria plays a huge, uh, huge part in contributing to that cycle of poverty. But we think by focusing on um, prevention, detection, and treatment methods that we'll be able to beat malaria. Just in the few minutes while I've been talking, over 17,000 people have become infected with malaria that have reported into a hospital clinic. There are tons more people that have gotten sick but haven't, haven't had the time or the opportunity to get to a clinic. And as represented by the number of people standing in the room now, um, 34 children have just died just while I've been speaking of malaria. Thank you. You can sit down. And so, as another, as keeping with the theme of teams, you can be part of the team. You can be a part of the team to help cure malaria. You can, learn, you can start by learning more about what my other colleagues do at the Center for Global Health and Diseases, because there are a lot of brilliant people over there doing, doing very different things also to, to stop malaria. You can write to Congress to help support malaria research. We, I myself am going before um, the Senate next week to celebrate World Malaria Day, which is April 25th, to talk to them about malaria and describe how treating malaria abroad helps us. It helps us because we're a global community, and it helps us because if we do nothing, it's going to come back with a vengeance because we can still get malaria here because we still have all the mosquitoes that transmit malaria. And so by doing some of these things, you can uh, help those be, uh, that are affected by malaria.